Oh, hey, oh, wait a minute. Sure who's here? Who's, who, who's here? Wait a Who's here at Harmony? Wait, wait. Oh, hello. How are you? Hey, Warren. Are you doing marvelously well? I think so. How are you? You know, as I, I'm good, actually. And as I pulled up, I was wondering, I wonder if Colin's here yet. What do you think? Do you, Colin's here? I don't know. Maybe Colin's here. Maybe. That's a heck of a drive. How long did it take you to get here? Like six or seven hours. I don't know, I'm not going to bring APBs on a plane. You know, I'm kind of paranoid. Six or seven hours from uh, San Francisco, San Jose? I like, like Palo Alto, Mountain View. Oh, yeah, of course, Palo Alto. Rather beautiful. It's All right, we're walking into Harmony here That's right. to go and test oh. out. Okay, here we go. We're going to get set up and we're going to try out, what's it called? What's this lovely device called? APB16, the world's first programmable analog processor. <laughs> Hi everybody, hope you're doing marvellously well. I'm sitting here with the rather wonderful Mr. Colin McDowell. How are you? I'm fine, Warren. How are you? I'm good. Colin is Mr. Mac DSP. And you may have noticed that because we just did an intro where he arrived in his... Well, I can actually see you pulling in. But I pulled up thinking you were going to have a rental car. And I pulled up and was like, wow, what a coincidence that the rental company gave you a car with the number plate Mac DSP. It's actually a gift from my wife when I still worked at DigiDesign a long time ago. Oh, really? And I was depressed that I could never own a fancy, cool, like, you know, Lamborghini or something like, something like that. Not that I'd want to, but I just, I wanted to have a cool car. I realized I was never going to own a cool car. So my wife came up with that license plate idea, the combination of my last name and digital signal processing, which is what my specialty is. And that's the McDSP license plate. It turned out to be the name of the company. So, uh -huh. yes, in short, I married the right person. Right. And she now effectively owns the whole company, logo, name, and everything. Oh, 50%, I guess. But, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we're here to talk about the All Points Bulletin. I mean, the APB-16. You told us about this at uh, Winter NAM. I did. Yeah, give us a lowdown. Well, I do remember that everybody was talking about it. Every plug-in manufacturer I went to was like, hey, you, you been able to see what Colin's doing? Yeah, like a lot of people with obsessive compulsive disorder, I just always think about this kind of stuff all the time. Um, and generally you come up with lots of bad ideas, but sometimes you come up with a couple of good ones. Um, and we thought, well, we have all this software that can model analog circuits. Could we take the software and somehow make an amalgamation of it in an analog signal chain that we could control programmatically and, and get some of the same kind of sounds you get from the plugin, but have it all controlled from the analog domain. That sounds like a cool thing to try. So we tried it for a while and some of it was pretty bad, but <laughs> some of it worked really, really well and we sort of you know, learned how we could make it work and a couple of years later, here we are with the APB-16. I suppose the obvious question everybody's gonna ask, so I will ask it, is what do you think the advantage of doing it this way, taking it outside of the computer and doing it as a separate? I mean, I think, you know, staying in the box is great. You know, it's whatever floats your boat. But there are so many people that still just want to go use some outboard gear. They want to get the tone or the saturation from an analog box of some kind. Um, and with that, you know, it, there's a lot of, I don't want to say hassle, but there's a lot of other steps to accomplish that. You have to have a patch bay. You have to have sends out of your audio interface and then get the signal to the outboard gear, set it up the way you want it, send the signal back, probably print those tracks because you're not going to, like, have that stuff in all the time. And all that, I think, sort of you know, takes away from some of the fun of going to analog. So we thought, well, what if we made a box that you could control from like a plugin, and you could automate the controls and save presets and recall it instantly, you know, perform all the audio, all the interconnectivity over Thunderbolt, so there's no, you know, hassle of a patch bay or cables or any of that. It's just a connection. You don't have to even think about it. You just put it in your session like a plugin. That would be a lot of fun. And I think that a lot of people, you know, who mix, I think, they have to balance those two things, juggling the technical stuff with the creative stuff. So we're trying to like, you know, alleviate as much of the technical stuff as they have to worry about and just give them something that's creative and sounds like fun to me. Well, it's a massive undertaking though because you've also got to come up with a digital interface. Uh, yeah. You've, you've, you've got to take, you've got to take digital information, turn it back to analog and then turn the analog information back to digital so you can send it back 
to the computer via Thunderbolt. Yep, and um, on, on top of all those things, you're exactly <laughs> right. We also, uh, the control signal, if you will, that comes out of the plug-in is married to the audio signal so that you have sample accurate control of your analog components. So that's something that no one does. And uh, stuff like that. Even we talked about the, the saturation circuits. They're all calibrated so that you can saturate to your heart's content. But when you go back to digital, it's not going to digitally clip in the digital uh, analog, the digital um, conversion, it's just going to saturate and then you just get it converted back to digital and you're golden. You don't have this you know, danger or, or potential of digital equipment. You don't have to monitor it. You can just you know, mix. Kind of like the old days. <laughs> That's fantastic. Uh, I mean, it seems like a massive undertaking. How long did it take you to, uh, from an initial idea to realization? Uh, about three and a half years. Three and a half years. Yeah, it, it's been a lot of work, but um, it's a lot of fun. Um, a lot of challenges, but a lot of learning, and I think it's, I don't know, like our own customers who kind of put their butts on the line every day, sometimes the company has to do it too and try to make something new, and uh, well, here we go. Okay, so component-wise, um, for the analog, yes. what are you using? I suppose, I'm going to ask that question because the catchphrases are transformers, are op amps, are tubes, are you know valves, as we say in England. People like those things that you know that they know that will colour the sound. So, what are the components in there that uh, okay. are unique to you? Okay, we use uh, AKM 32-bit converters. Yep. Um, for both you know digital to analog and analog yep. to digital. Um, we got Burr Brown op amps. Like I think 104 Burr wow. Brown op amps are in the box, and there a couple. are. Yeah, a couple. <laughs> um, and then we have like, you know, like Wema caps, um, stuff like that. There's no transformers in it, and there's no tubes. Um, it's basically, you know, imagine, you know, the box is a 1U, you know, 15-inch sure. deep rack box, and it's basically, you know, that whole box is mostly mm -hmm. comprised of, it's just one line of analog circuits. You know, like, like some, some VCA stuff in there, other op amps and stuff, and some configurations, um, so we can, you know, do lots of dynamics and some pseudo-EQ kind of processing. And then a lot of saturation processing. So the VCAs, what, what are the VCAs in there? Oh, geez, they're uh, it's a that VCA. I couldn't I couldn't tell like you. Like a twelve oh two, like you would use in a DBX or a, a SSL. Boy, you're quizzing me, but that's a good one. Um, I'll answer this way. It's one of the most expensive ones they make because it has the widest dynamic range they can possibly offer. It's probably that. I think for the experts out there, which I'm not, I believe that's the 1202, which is the one they use in the SSLs. And okay. The, yeah. the, it's a modeled on the original DBX 161, I believe. I, I, I think. I believe so. Basically, um, I know a lot of folks want to know um, components modeled after this or that. We, we basically just went for what are the ones that have the best signal to noise ratio, the Great. widest dynamic range. Um, the, the best tolerance for you know heat. The thing's got 104 amp amps inside, so it has to be some kind of reliable box. Um, all those types of things made into a system that is um, uh, going to last a long time, is highly serviceable. God forbid if something happens to it, and um, it's just uh, you can use a lot of them. Wonderful. I love you doing this though because <clears throat> you are a pioneer of the early kind of. I, I wouldn't say emulations is is kind of the wrong way, but you were the first person I was aware of that made plug-ins sound like analog equipment. I mean, when the analog channel itself came out, that was, in fact, I was just talking about this with a couple of guys yesterday. I think every producer, engineer, and mixer I know has made DSP. There are many plug-ins that people favor, but all of us have your EQs, and nearly everybody I knew uses analog channel. It's like a, it, it's almost become a sort of stock plug-in, if you like. You know, what we love about your stuff is that you open it up and you go, I just need it to be brighter. And you, and, and, and just the sound of your, your plugins is always makes things sound better. If I want to get in there and do tons of detail stuff, there's a 10,000 people that make things with screens and, and ways of me seeing all this. But just the, the simplicity of what you make is what always draws people to it. Sounds good, easy to use. So I haven't used this yet. We're going to do it all on camera. And I'm thinking to myself, that's, that's something to live up to. Something okay. simple, sounds good, easy to use, great for a dumb person like me that doesn't want to sit there and, you know, have f three screens to look through and figure it out. So we have a session here. We have Robert John and the Wreck Gypsy. Uh, lots of our Academy members and other Produce Like a Pro members will know this song. This song was recorded um, pretty much live. Um, there are no drum samples, nothing. 
What's interesting is the mix opened up with plugins missing on it. So it's going to be fun for me. I could pinpoint things that I'd like to improve and frankly, just, you know, use a new APB 16 on. So I suppose, you know what, probably an obvious thing and a very important thing be vocals. Okay, so here is a vocal with no plugins on it whatsoever. It's been such a long time Gypsy woman running through my mind Cool, so what might be fun to do is, like obvious things, is, you know, he's fairly dynamic. I did apply a bit of compression going in, but not a huge amount. So, um, what I would typically do, um, I do a couple of things. I might do, sometimes I do an EQ first, yep. if I need high passing into a compressor. And then I would go, I would brighten it. Yep. So I'd go high pass, compression, brighten, and then more aggressive compression, because I like to boost the high end into a compressor, kind of gives it a bit of a spankiness. So if you started off with the root tube compressor, the one at the bottom of the list, yep. that is your you know, typical tube modeled compressor. There are nice. no tubes in the APB, but it has you know a notoriously slow attack and recovery time. Yep. So you can kind of dig into the vocal some, you can get a little bit of a tone out of the compressor, and you can sort of help maybe ride out some of the volume changes you're getting from whatever the performer is providing you. So listen. It's been such a long time Gypsy woman running through my mind It's been such a long time Give me a kiss and then left me behind It's been such a long time Gypsy woman... So we get that B for the bin a bit more. Mm -hmm. It's been such a long time. I'm going to bring a recovery to fast. It's been such a long time. Gypsy woman running through my mind. What is, what is the fastest attack and release we could go for? The chicken head. The chicken head, okay. Uh, again, why is it chicken head? Because when you have your own company, call whatever the heck you want. So uh, <laughs> there you go, chicken head. Chicken head compressor. It's been such a long time Gypsy woman running through my mind It's been such a long time Give me a kiss and then left me behind It's been such a long time Give me a kiss and then left me behind I like that. I like the, the brightness on this one compared with the other one. It's got like a little tiny bit of... Uh, um air on the top. What's what's this? Am I allowed to ask you what it's modeled on or what the pretense of it is? Okay, I know it kind of looks like an Altec, but um, it's it just not, happens to be green. It just happens to be green. Yeah. Uh, I used to play in a band and we had a bunch of Altec um, amps and I just always liked the way they looked. So I thought, you know, this one's going to look like one of those. We're going to call it the chicken head because we can. Yeah. And um, here we are. But it's basically, a, this one has the most, um, the, the fastest attack in these kind of times. Yeah. You know, the rate the compression ratio is the highest, it's also yep. variable. That sauce control you might find useful like on a bass guitar yep. or like a drum set. Yep. But actually will give you some EQ, some like okay. low end bias. So as yep. you're compressing a lot, you'll experience some low end bias or boost yep. while the compression action is occurring. Again, all this is in the analog domain. Um, and the chicken head is sort of is perhaps the most uh, broadest range of controls or the most okay. aggressive anyway. It's been such a long time. Give me a kiss and then left me behind. Let's do it bypass. It's been such a long time. That's really, really, really nice what it's doing now. Back on. It's been such a long time. Gypsy woman running through my mind. I like particularly what I'm hearing on the end of phrases. It's been such a long time. It's a fast enough release time that it's not um, grabbing too hard on the end of the phrases. So that's really sweet. It's been such a long time. Now, is uh, oh, I see. So the ratio, okay. So if I hold it, okay, 50 to 500. That's very familiar numbers for Mac DSP. <laughs> very good. <laughs> Just for the source, I know it's not favored, as you say, for, for the learner, but I just want to hear what it does. It's been such a long time. 
Gypsy woman running through my mind It's been such a long time Gypsy woman running through my mind Is it helping the high end a little bit? That's, it seems to be interesting. Interesting. Gypsy woman running. Gypsy woman run. I think the fullness that it's adding is making the balance feel nicer. I actually like it. It's possible. Yeah. Gypsy woman running through my mind. Also, when that sauce is engaged, because, yep. you know, sauce, barbecue, chicken head, anyway, yep. <laughs> um, that is giving you some low end bias, but you're correct is it's going to cause the compressor to respond differently so some of the high end might get also you know it's like a yin yang thing I want some more right. base but I might also there's some give and take there that might give you something that you like um, but it's definitely it, it's definitely evening out the whole vocal gypsy woman running through my mind Engage it. gypsy woman running through my mind I'd be tempted to leave it on all the time because it seems to make the vocal feel much fuller all the way around. Yeah, um, what you're experimenting with are some of the things what internally as a company we're still experimenting with going, oh, well that sounds pretty damn good. We should do more of that. You know, it's, right. we have this analog circuit yeah. that has it's an amalgamation of many things. And we say, oh, well, let's try this. Let's try that. And back to my earlier point, sometimes you try something and go, okay, that sucked. Put that over here in the sucked right. column. But the sauce column is like, oh, well that's pretty good. Let's calibrate it this way, put it into this kind of compression algorithm implementation, and run with it. But you know, there's, that's why people ask me, oh, what else is coming? I'm like, there's a lot more coming. We're just Great. touching the edge of this like programmable analog thing we've come up with. OK, so I'm now going to re-engage the new tube, because we should have a much more even signal going in now. Gypsy woman running through my mind. It's been such a long time. That's nice. See, that, that to me seems like a logical thing to do. So what I've done, what we've done is we've gone a bit more aggressive on the compression coming in on the, using the chicken head, and we've added that coloration. Now with the Moo Tube, I'm getting about 3 dB the whole time. It's not dancing around like nope. it was, so it's bringing everything nicely forward for me. Gypsy woman running through my mind. It's been such a long time. Let's see how it feels in the mix. It's been such a long time. Gives you warm and run through my mind. It's been such a long time. Give me a kiss and then let me behind. Nice. Fantastic. Okay, what other goodies do we have in here? Well, if you're kind of liking the sound of that Moo tube, I was going to suggest the El Moo limiter. Now, it's, it's a limiter, yes, but it's mm -hmm. a really soft knee limiter. You know, McDSP is one of the first companies to make like a soft knee kind of limiter. Right. So you do not really actually hear the limiting action, it, that transition from doing nothing to having a limited signal. It's a very broad transition, yeah. so it's hard to catch when the limiter is engaged or not. But what's cool about the El Moo is in the lower right-hand corner, we give you a continuous control over a saturation circuit. Ooh, nice. Now, every plugin you see, you bring up here from APB Realm, has a selected calibrated saturation circuit for that system of components. And this one, though, we're giving you some control over it. So you could use it perhaps in the way like you want to have a consistent level at some point. This one can sort of try to attack both problems. It gives you a telemeter, so it's trying to give you a consistent level, but it's going to push this thing right up to the edge of the dynamic range of the analog system and then with the saturation control you can dial in more saturation yeah it's going to get a little bit louder but you're just basically putting the signal right there at the edge and you can decide how much over the edge or not you want to mm -hmm. be if you want to give like your rock vocal a little more of an edge um one more point sorry the, yep. the peak control is actually a digital control because we thought well look if you want to pull back what you're getting the gain you're getting from a limiter mm -hmm. Let's do that in the digital domain so you have the maximum signal to noise ratio in the analog domain. And then we'll let you, if you need to bring it back a couple of dB, we're not going to cost you a couple of dB of signal to noise ratio from the analog system. Sure. We'll do it in the digital. And that's a really good example of, yeah, we're trying to do an analog thing, but we're also trying to like bridge the gap between, oh, this is what I would want if I was doing an analog I like to send and return. I've, li I've enjoyed that give and take. Um, one of the first things I noticed the plugins was forcing hardware manufacturers to do was to put mix controls 
you know, simple as that. You know, guys like you make a make a plug in, you can destroy the sound, and then you can turn it down to zero and bring it in gradually. And then you started seeing a few years ago, everybody building hardware suddenly had a mix control. And I, so I think this is the perfect realm where we're sharing analog technology and digital and getting the best out of both. Yes. So what I did is I moved the Moo tube up one and now or two, and I put the L Moo at the very end. So let's see what we can do. But I obviously want to really hear the saturation. It's been such a long time Gypsy woman running through my mind It's been such a long It's been such a long time Gypsy woman running through my mind It's been such a long time Give me a kiss and then left me behind I like it that's a nice, even saturation. Yeah, yeah. because you know, the limiter is taking the signal right up here and trying to keep it here yeah. so you can get a consistent amount of saturation yeah. as opposed to like, oh, I saturated, oh, I saturated. It's yeah. always right there. Yeah. That's why we sort of paired them together that way. I have a question. I know yes, we're mixing sir. here. Okay, what about for live tracking? Right now, the round trip from an A to B plugin to the box and back is 2,063 samples. This is really only because Pro Tools, like any DAW, mm -hmm. to get lots and lots of tracks to play back, it has different numbers of samples in every channel. So we have to basically pick like a common divisor. Yeah. Anyway, um, but we might be able to counter that at some point. Unlike a digital outboard box or something, where it can take buffers of this and buffers of that, analog's like, I need all 16 channels, or however many you're using, it needs all the audio there all at once. So if one channel's like, oh, I'm only giving you 64 samples, oh, I'm giving you 1024 or whatever, well, we need them all, because then we're gonna process them all, because it's analog. Yeah. And so that's what causes this latency. But yeah, basically the round trip is 2063, but we are working to make it a lot less, so that hopefully you can track with it one day soon. Great. It's been such a long time Gypsy woman running through my mind El Lyco. What I've liked about this is we haven't applied any EQ to this vocal. This is all all of the you know additional high mid kind of saturation that's going on, that low end fullness. That's all come from the compression. Okay. Now Speaking of, we talked about uh, low-end instruments. I want to go because there's nothing, no EQ on my kick bus here. Now this is just a D112 and a FET47 com combination with very basic EQ. I just use stock, boost the schnizzle out of it on the kick in, and then a similar kind of thing on the high mids here. So I've done a lot of stuff on this live kick because I didn't want to use any samples. So, ton of weight. But you could see before, for those of you that can see the grayed out, there was actually a plug in here, which was doing not quite limiting, but quite aggressive. So I want to grab um, what's the first one? What's the one with the saturate, the chicken head? There's that one. I was also going to say you might want to try the C673A. Okay, that's let's do good it. for just low end stuff. Nice. And is there any particular uh, model this might be or anything that you, you were uh, thinking about when you came up with this? It is loosely based on a Fairchild, but you know, our Fairchild model at this point is about 20 years old and has gone through all kinds of changes and twists and turns. Um, and it is also one of the more complicated compression models that we have. And so it actually this plugin was the first one we prototyped as something that could be a proof of concept for the analog processing box. And we saw we could do this one, then we were like, well, if we can do this one, Nice. We're off to the races. So this is like the first. And I guess if you want to be extra nerdy, it's orange and black. Yeah, it's like the San Francisco Giants, but it's also like a train set that my dad gave me when I was five. And I thought, oh, I want to be an engineer. I had no idea what that meant, but it sounded really cool. <laughs> so basically, if you got a DTNI Lionel train set, you would find the coloring is pretty darn close to what that train looks like. Well, you know why I went, was it more than anything? Because it had the word time constant on it. Mm. <laughs> okay, so here is it bypassed. Bring it in. 
you know, the weight is fantastic. All right, now, now I just want to move down. You know what, let's see what this sounds like on the whole cat. I like that. I like that a lot. But now, of course, I want to take the bass and try that same plugin on the bass. So here it is on the bass. Quite aggressive. with these plugins already it's like that a, a, a nice sense of security now when I mix um, I'm blessed you know I have an SSL at my studio this is also my studio by the way everybody this is a brand new Audient 8024 and it's the first time I've used it which is pretty huge first time I've been in the room so put the console in it even beat the, the, the video of us showing the install anyway what I love about working in the analog realm is there's a sort of sense of security when you're feeding stuff through pieces of equipment that A, you may have owned for about 50 years, but basically ones you've seen in every single studio. Um, I do hear, and this is probably, it might be alien to some people that haven't grown up with analog, but you know what it's like, you go into like some of these old school like studios and you see people mixing and they have racks and racks of gear and that's where my bass goes through and it goes through four pieces of hardware and then comes back in and love it or hate it, they rarely go over there and change anything. They just add the single in there, maybe they'll take, change a little, maybe a little bit of release, maybe that's hitting it a little bit too hard, but that becomes like a security blanket of sound. I'm sort of getting that similar feeling, it definitely has that sort of analog, oh, and it goes back to the ethos we were saying about your plugins anyway, that sort of like make it sound better. I just, oh, that sounds better, as opposed to like, give me an hour to tweak this. Um, was that, I suppose I've got to ask you, was that the philosophy was to? Yeah, you know, if you can make, you know, lots of analog outboard gear sounds great, it's pretty simple to use. So, yep. but, but like you say, those people always racks and racks of gear. They have one rack for their bass track and they don't use it for anything else. They don't want to change it. So with the APB stuff, if you liked this plugin or that plugin for, or a certain set of them for something, that's great. They'll just get recalled from your session every time. You don't have to like dedicate, you know, a couple square you know, meters of your studio, you know, to that gear that you'll never touch again. You can just bring it back and bring it back and get more utility out of the analog processing available to you. Right. I like that. I'm glad, I'm glad that that fits because that's, that's what it feels like. That's what it feels like you're doing here. El Lyco. Okay, what have we not looked at yet? Well, we have two other ones called the C18 and the L18. They're more like the pristine don't really try to screw up the audio, but they do have a couple of unique features. Um, the C18 is a compressor. It's like compressor banks, sort of. Right. Except it's all analog, but it has a feature from analog channel, oh geez, compressor bank, excuse me, called um, the byte control, mm -hmm. a bi-directional intelligent trans enhancement, B-I-T-E, byte. Ah, 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 ah. Right. Sorry folks, these are the jokes. Um, but, <laughs> you know, what the- Pairing here tonight. Yeah. So what the bike control does is it lets transients through the compressor yeah. while the body of the signal is still compressed. So if you had something that's, you know, like a piano where you have like some, you know, solo on top with some chords in the middle, you press the bike uh. button, like maybe some of that stuff will like shine through, but the body of the piano is compressed. Or if you have a vocalist who's maybe like got some siblings that you really are trying to keep, but you're still trying to compress, you know, the overall vocal, yeah. you can bring some of that siblings back with the bike control. 
other than that, it's pretty much like a bread and butter compressor. It's not meant to really have much of a character to it. Okay. Uh, it is still all analog, so that's what you get. Okay, well, I actually got it on a guitar, but I might drag it down then to the Rhodes while you're describing it. So I'm now going to put it on the Rhodes. Okay. So this is the bite. Yep. Nice. I want to. Yeah, might, okay, so I see what it did there. It was. Yeah, it might cause it to have to drop the threshold like another six or nine dB. Yeah. Because now the commercial is like, oh, I'm gonna let that through, and you're like, oh wait. So maybe yeah. grab even more, and then pop the bite in. Bring that in and out and have a listen. I know you're saying it's not colored, but it definitely still adding a little bit of... It does. A little um, bit of... Yeah, I mean, I guess I know the intentional color when we try to apply the other ones, or this one we try to keep it clean, right. and then we all said, oh, we should put in the bite control, and I was like, I'm not sure that's going to work. I'm like, oh, it does work. And then right. so, right. yeah, it's, it's, yeah, I mean, have a good time with it. I'm definitely feeling everything... Um, how can I say this in a word that doesn't sound like the most cliche thing? There is definitely uh, a warmth to it. Now, I hate that word because it means 50 different things to 50 different people. At but, least. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but there is definitely a sense of everything coming back uh, fuller, uh, richer, warmer. I don't know what the right word is, but I think I, I know what you're going for. <laughs> so I'm going to try on the guitar on this one. riff here, I had added a sand zap. Which I always like, but the danger of the sand zap plug, as you remember from the old Avid days, is it is a little on the digital schmidgedal side. Okay, that's true. So let's see if we can analog it out a little bit. Um, what would you say is like, I suppose, wouldn't it be... It might, because the old and limb, they were like, if you yep. give you a consistent level and you can keep it at a saturation edge and get a consistent yep. amount of saturation. Let's go there. I like that. I was just having this conversation with somebody at Abbey Road yesterday. How much of a name drop is that? I was That's actually at Abbey Road one. yesterday. And we were just trying to figure out um, how to bring in... Look, there's... And everybody can correct me if I'm wrong, because I usually am. But there isn't any really good analog limiters that, sound, that do the same job as digital. Because when you want to limit in digital, you can just pretty much go... Bah! There it is, nothing happens, that's it. It's now a completely flat wave. And that's just a reality. So a lot of uh, guys and girls I know that have been producing for a long time and mixing get a little frustrating because frustrated because they're competing against, you know, guys and girls are mixing on laptops 
with plugins that make everything go bap, 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 and everything's just loud and crunchy, and they're in an analog world. Um, so they're resorting to using digital stuff, and then they always go, but now my mixes sound more digital. How do I get that, you know, quote unquote, analog sound? I was gonna say warmth, but that would be ridiculous, but I just did. How do I get that analog feeling, but also limit it? This might be the answer, which means, why don't I put this on the master bus? Ooh. And there's actually two choices here for you, Warren. There's okay. the L Rue, there's also the L18, which is meant to be more of a pristine limiter, but it does have some other options. It has a color control, yep. like a high-end shimmy mm -hmm. control, if you want to look at shiny or not. Yep. But this limiter also has a knee control, so if you want to have a hard knee, that's you know right. all the way to the left. If you want to have the soft knee, like you're kind of getting with the L Rue, you yep. can kind of control it here with the continuous control. It does not have the saturation feature of the Elmo. That's okay. Just another tool in your toolbox kind of thing. I, I think everybody's different, but because I did grow up on, in, in console world and, and hybrid and everything, I, I like to do my wrongness on individual elements or bust elements yeah. rather than just think, oh, I'll just put some plugins on my, on my mix bus. I, I, it's just not me. I mean, obviously, tape used to do those things for us, but I still think personally think it's a little naive to think just if I put a two-track tape emulation on my, on my, on my um, uh, master bus, so suddenly I'm going to sound like I recorded it on tape. All right, so let's, let's hear this. Color's flat, but we have engaged it, so we can hear what that does. Knees super fast, all the way over here. Going down, let's have a listen. So tell me, what's this color algorithm doing here? It sounds like I'm getting a lot more response in the high mids up here. I mean, like yep. it came, came to life and excitement level. What is the uh, schmizzle that's going on with the sure. color? Uh, the schmizzle is, is that um, <laughs> it's an AI-based curve to yeah. come up with a tone that I think is what people like to hear. Yep. But um, the reason I have a, a reasonable collection of these is because my uh, kid in college said, Dad, give me a job this summer. Here you go, run these experiments, come up with some curves that don't suck. Nice. Okay. And she did a good job. So is it, is it, is it variable or am I just literally just increasing it? No, it, it is variable. It is continuous. Okay. Um, and uh, it is, that is also, that is a digital side EQ. Okay. But it is also going to be calibrated with the rest of this analog system so that we're not going to cause you to digitally clip. It's all, that this is, these are some of the things that we're trying to address under the hood of all these plugins is we give you a gain or a tweak or a bias or a boost. But we're trying to keep it within a realm of you will not let you do something that you don't want, but we'll push you all the way to the edge so you can find those places on the edge that you want to be, but you don't have to worry about going over the edge and causing like a problem in your session on a technical level. Nice. Very nice indeed. Um, so, anything else that you want to uh, uh, illustrate here? We've, we've touched on a uh, lot of schnizzle. You covered all of it very nicely, Warren, uh, as I knew you would. Thank you very much. Thank you. So, I love this. Um, I think it's delivered on the promises you made. You didn't really make any promises, but the ideas that you made. The yes, promises sir. to yourself. 
that this would be analog and digital technology married together. The feeling I love about this um, is, yes, it feels like a Mac DSP product, which means it's, you know, it's simple, easy to use. I'm not, I think after you leave, I may have one or two email questions, but I feel like just this, you know, 40 minutes that we spent playing with it is enough for me to understand what they all do. But it gives me the security that I feel when I'm feeding stuff through analog that I'm not, I don't know how to explain it. Did analog people understand what I'm talking about? You, you start putting a lot of digital plugins because you love them, you know, and they do great things and, and they've got wonderful graphics and you can sit there and boost and cut tiny frequencies. You love all that stuff. But at the end of the day, you start feeling like my mix is sounding, I hate this word, like digital. It doesn't feel, it, it, you know, every mix engineer says the same thing, which is why every company makes half of their plugins are analog emulations. This, this is delivering on your uh, idea. Thank you very much. Question, how many plugins can you open? Uh, how many instances can you, can you use? That's a good question. So the APB-16 is a 16-channel process. So like this limiter you're looking at, yep. if you're looking at the stereo version of it, that's well, two channels. So yep. you can have eight of these. But let's say you brought up a mono one of these, you could have 16 of them. It's any okay. combination of any of them. Um, and, and these are all basically, if I call them, they're, they're one-channel APB plugins. They use one channel of the analog capability in the mm -hmm. APB-16. Then there'll be other ones down the line that use many more or many less, like they're like a multi-band compressor or something that would probably use a few more channels of the analog processing. But these ones that you see here in this video, they're all uh, you know one-channel uh, analog processing box plugins. Fantastic! I want to try something quickly because you just made me think about this. Oh. Now, I I love unpredictability. So I set up a drum bus here. Um, so I've got three different elements. I've got different compression going on with some elements of the drums, and then I've got the kick and the snare with their own. So actually it's this. And then I've got this. It's destroyed. And then of course I've got a clean drum bus. And this lacks some of the EQ and stuff that I was doing earlier, so it's a little, not quite as refined as the original one because we don't have all the plugins going. I'm now going to create a drum bus of a drum bus. So this is all of the individual elements. What is going to give me the most aggressive of all of the com stereo compressors? What would be the most aggressive energy compressor? Chicken head. Chicken head? Okay, let's grab the chicken head. Because, you know, as we were playing back this mix, I'm thinking to myself, oh, I haven't quite got the energy it's supposed to, and that's because some of the plugins I was using didn't ha they're not opening up. So let's have a listen. El Lyco. So I think for me then, um, with the 16 instances, that's probably the kind of uses I'm going to go. I'm going to be bussing things to it. You know, I might use it in individual elements or use it on the vocal like we did, but probably I'm going to be bussing and, you know, using it for coloration like we just did there, but also energy. That definitely put a, a ton of energy into it. Um, great. Glad you like it. Thank you ever so much. Thank you. Uh, please, as ever, everybody, leave a bunch of comments and questions below. Um, we're just scratching the surface. I've obviously, I brought up a track here where I, half of the EQs weren't even on. So it was actually kind of fun to hear what we could do by using the coloration of the compression. So that's rather fun. Um, I might throw you under the bus if there's specific qu comments and questions that I don't know the answer to. Bring it on. Okay, marvelous. Thank you ever so much. Thank you.